So, you want to know all about the last two series of Happy Valley? What time's your dinner break? Well, strap in while we take a trip to the green and not always pleasant hills of West Yorkshire. I'll let you in and then you can come through to my office and you can start at the beginning, all right? This somewhat ironically titled drama centres around Catherine Kaywood, a no-nonsense police sergeant in the Calder Valley, whose unorthodox methods, kind heart and ability to find humour in the darkest of places make her loved by colleagues and friends alike. Her inability to switch off means she often brings her work home, where she lives with her closest confidant and sister Claire, a recovering alcoholic and heroin addict who's always there to support and make her copious cups of tea. Tea. But Catherine's home life is no less eventful than her work life. Her grandson Ryan, for whom she's a full-time carer, is playing up at school, which Catherine fears has something to do with the inherited genes of his wayward ex-convict father, Tommy Lee Royce, a man she believes is responsible for raping and impregnating her daughter. And when my husband found her, she hanged herself in a bedroom. But stoic Catherine is determined to care for her grandson, even if the decision has pushed her son away and made her marriage fall apart. Her ex now lives with his new wife, yet neither he nor Catherine can quite put their relationship to bed, mainly because they still keep jumping into it. Anyway, that's enough background for now, let's get into series one, which kicks off with sheepish accountant Kevin Weatherall imploring his business tycoon boss, Neverson Gallagher, for a pay rise to send his kids to private school. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, Kevin. I'm gonna think about it. But Neverson refuses, leaving Kevin feeling fobbed off and furious. Half that company should be mine, Jenny. That is, until he unwittingly uncovers a drug smuggling operation at his local caravan park and convinces the ringleader, Ashley, to kidnap Nevison's daughter, Anne, for ransom. How would you like to make half a million pounds? And so the amateur plan is put into place, with the help of Ashley's lackeys, Lewis Whippy, and none other than recently released from prison, Tommy Lee Royce. Get the kettle on. There's something I want to talk through with you. Meanwhile, Catherine learns of Tommy's release back into the valley and seems ready to take the law into her own hands to find him, even if it means staking out the local Chinese takeaway. Act normally, serve him, whatever, and then ring me. When Neverson has a change of heart about Kevin's pay rise, Kevin tries to cancel the whole harebrained scheme with Ashley. Shit, 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 shit. But it's too late. The wheels are quite literally in motion and they're carrying Anne with them. Over in the basement where poor Anne's being kept, the tension is building. Kidnapper Lewis is at loggerheads with Tommy over his inhumane treatment of their captive. Yet Tommy's more concerned about Lewis's loose lips after he unthinkingly discloses their boss's name and, frustrated by his criminal incompetence, he beats him up. Then the pair are forced to move Anne after Catherine trails Tommy to the house. And when young copper Kirsten pulls their van over for speeding and asks to see inside, it all ends horribly, with Tommy running her over. Catherine then breaks into the house linked to Tommy, finds loads of sinister signs. The fact that I'm a police officer don't make it legal. And traces the property to Ashley. What it looks like to me is that someone's been held in there against the and treated rather unpleasantly. So now Tommy and Lewis have got to move Anne again. If you both give me five grand each, I'll do it. This time, Tommy pays his drug-addled mum to use her basement and learns that Sergeant Kaywood called round to see him and there's a rumour her grandson is in fact his son. Did you know she had a kid before she died? Who did? Tommy's so distracted by this news, he stalks Ryan after school and reveals he's his dad. I'm your dad. You're my son. <laughs> Catherine denies everything to Ryan, angrily calling around Tommy's mums. If he comes anywhere near Ryan, I'll be bothered. Only to inadvertently discover that Anne's being kept in the basement. But her heroic rescue's poorly timed as Tommy returns and a vicious fight ensues. Just as it's curtains for Catherine, Anne breaks free, hits Tommy with a dumbbell and drags her saviour to safety like an absolute legend. Now Catherine's in hospital, Ashley and Kevin are taken in for questioning and Tommy kills Lewis whilst hiding from the police. He then disguises himself as an unthreatening book nerd to move around town, gain his son's trust and lure him to his hideout. Now put me in prison. Why? Well, I told you I've done stuff. Anyway, 
Ashley's released from the Nick after giving up info on the people further up the drugs chain, who respond by putting a bullet in his head, Kevin's sent to prison, and Catherine finally recovers and returns home, where well-meaning Claire throws her a rubbish birthday party. I said I didn't want a sodding party! Finally, after bonding with his dad, Ryan slips up, accidentally revealing Tommy's hiding place. So Tommy decides to set them both alight. <laughs> But just as things are about to go up in flames, Catherine blazes in on the back of a tip-off and gives him what for. And although it might seem like she's taking mercy on Tommy by not finishing him off, it's actually her greatest act of revenge. You still with me? All right, on to series two, where Tommy's in prison, Anne's become a police officer, Claire has a new boyfriend who's also a recovering alcoholic, and Catherine discovers the brutalized body of Tommy's mum when out solving a sheep rustling case. Everyone knows Catherine hates Tommy, so naturally she becomes a suspect in the murder investigation, which she's livid about. Perhaps she'd like to clean your mouth out while she's down there. From prison, Tommy vows to take Catherine down and win back his son, with the help of his besotted and meek-mannered new girlfriend, Frances. Under false pretenses, she becomes a teaching assistant at Ryan's school, subtly grooming him to forgive and love his dad and then another dead body is found, murdered in the same way as Tommy's mum, and the police realise they have a serial killer on their hands. Meanwhile, one of the detectives on the murder case, John Wadsworth, is trying to end things with his mistress, Vicky. She's threatening to destroy his life unless he gives her money after drugging and taking photos of him in a humiliating state. Desperate to get Vicky to delete the photos, John ends up strangling her with a lamp cord, emulating the serial killer he's been investigating and burning down her flat, you know, to erase the evidence. Across town, another body is discovered. This time, you guessed it, Vicky's. Although most assume she's a victim of the serial killer, D.I. Shackleton is doubtful, as the serial killer usually murders sex workers. Speaking of surprises, Ryan receives a lavish birthday gift from his dad, planted by Francis, but the gesture's not enough for Tommy, who's getting increasingly agitated about the lack of progress in taking Catherine down. Catherine's also agitated because apparently she's got a nickname at work which no one's brave enough to share. Are they really share? No. Can't say I blame them. You've got a torch, haven't you? Around the same time, young farmer Darrell, whose sheep keep getting nicked, gets himself arrested for assaulting a group of goading guys with a ball hammer, and he's very unhappy to have his DNA swapped. Meanwhile, the wrong man's charged with the four murders and then released when there's another one. This time, all attention's on the mysterious hit-and-run driver of a red car near the scene. When Darrell's mum, Alison Gars, spots a big dent in his red car, well, she begins to ask questions, and lo and behold, Darrell confesses that he's the one responsible for all the killings. Unable to imagine her otherwise seemingly innocent son coping in prison, Alison shoots him, then takes an overdose. Catherine encounters the grisly scene when she comes to visit the farm, saves Alison's life, and prizes the truth from her, learning a crucial detail that Daryl didn't kill Vicky, so that must be someone else. As if the roller coaster of her work wasn't twisty enough, Catherine discovers that Ryan's teacher is Tommy's girlfriend and ambushes her at school, getting her arrested for fraud. After she cools off, Catherine tries to help Francis see the truth, that she was conditioned and indoctrinated by Tommy and reveals that his engagement to her is a sham. In fact, she's not his only woman. Armed with intel that Vicky used to blackmail her lovers and hearing Anne's suspicions about John's personal life, Catherine pieces together that he must be Vicky's killer. But John's not ready to surrender. He flees to the edge of a bridge and just as it looks like Catherine's talked him down, he jumps to his death. And things have gone south for Tommy too, whose connection to the outside world is cut off after being banned from having visitors. He's just about going stir-crazy, that is, until he receives a letter written by none other than his very own son, making us worry and wonder, where will their relationship go from here? We'll have to find out in Series 3.